Hold, you crafty ones, strangers to work and pilferers of other men's brains. Think not rashly to lay your thievish hands upon my works. Beware, know you not that I have a grant from the most glorious Emperor Maximilian that no one throughout the imperial dominion shall be allowed to print or sell fictitious imitations of these engravings? Listen, and bear in mind that if you do so through spite or through covetousness, not only will your goods be confiscated, but your bodies also placed in mortal danger. Albrecht Dürer. This may well be the most belligerent copyright notice ever penned. It appeared in the Colophon to an engraving series called Life of the Virgin, published in Nuremberg in 1511. Its author and the creator of the engravings, the great painter and printmaker Albrecht Dürer, had good reason to fear forgers. Five years earlier, Dürer had received one of his prints from the original 1502 Life of the Virgin series, sent to him from Venice by a friend. Dürer's prints were wildly popular throughout Europe, considered highly collectible, and yet a more affordable alternative to commissioning an original painting. Dürer cultivated his status as a celebrity artist, one whose name alone associated with a print or painting would raise its value. He was perhaps the first internationally self-promoting artist in history, more akin to Jeff Koons or Damien Hirst from a publicity standpoint, rather than the solitary, morose likes of his contemporaries, such as Giorgione or Titian. He even created what some consider the first artist's trademark, a stylized monogram signature featuring a small uppercase letter D between the legs of a large uppercase letter A. The authenticity of Dürer prints was assured by the inclusion of this famed monogram cum signature. In 1506, in his Nuremberg studio, surrounded by pots of pigment, coal to make ink, quill pens and vellum pages, wood for stretchers stacked in a corner, and everywhere the smell of sweat, leather, and varnish, Dürer examined the woodcut engraving from his Life of the Virgin series. He discovered that it was nearly identical, but it was not his handiwork. It was the work of a master forger. Dürer surely rolled his eyes, muttered curses under his breath, and let out a long sigh. Dürer's name, monogram, and prints were of such renown throughout Europe that as early as 1494, at least six different printmakers were producing copies of Dürer prints and selling them as originals. Dürer was determined to fight to protect his name and his work from piracy. He would bring what might be considered the first intellectual properties lawsuit, first against a madman in his native Nuremberg who was doodling nonsense onto canvas and selling his doodles in front of the town hall as Dürer paintings, and then in 1506 when a more serious case was held in Venice. One of Dürer's friends had sent him one of these fraudulent woodcut prints from Venice, where it had been published by a family of printers by the name of Dal Jesus. A quick investigation led to the artist behind the copies, a master printmaker and sometime pornographer called Marcantonio Ramondi. Ramondi was already an established printmaker, having been contracted to reproduce, legally, the prints of Raphael's most famous paintings. These inexpensive portable prints allowed Raphael's art to be seen in the far reaches of Europe by those who were unable to travel to Rome or Urbino and spread his influence widely. Ramondi was also notorious for having illustrated a pornographic book called I Modi, roughly translated as The Positions, a sort of sexual manual with text by the notorious and wickedly witty Pietro Aretino. To give a sense of Aretino's humor, uh, the Venetian playwright and general wit is said to have died of a stroke induced from laughing too hard at a dirty joke made at the expense of his sister. The unquestionably skillful Ramondi had purchased original Dürer prints while in Venice in 1506, and from these he created woodcut plates from scratch, including the famous AD monogram. The Dal Jesus family used these plates to produce prints which were then sold as Dürer originals. But the case was far from straightforward, for while Ramondi had copied every detail of Dürer's incredibly intricate prints, a work of miraculous and admirable skill on the part of the forger, he had included three alterations to the original design which distinguished his creations as copies, and which would eventually be used as an escape clause to get him off the hook. Ramondi included his own monogram, an intertwined MAF inspired by Dürer's trademark. He also added the device of the Dal Jesus publishing house, the YHS of Christ, placed inside a squared quatrefoil. And finally, Ramondi included two triangles arranged in the shape of an hourglass, which were included in the design on the Dal Jesus print shop. 
It took close examination to notice these additions, but they were there. They raised questions as to whether Ramondi himself intended these prints to be passed off as Durer originals, or if he merely intended to make an homage after Durer. It may have been that the Dalyezus family firm, without Ramondi's complicity, sought to increase its revenues by selling these prints as originals, for a Durer would fetch many times the price of a Ramondi copy after Durer. The dynamic and ingenious Albrecht Durer had not quite, had quite enough of the forgers for his work. He brought a lawsuit against Ramondi and the Dalyezus family in Venice in an effort to prevent the Dalyezus printers from publishing and selling more of these copies. He thought that this might set an example and hopefully dissuade future forgers. But the suit proved only partially successful. The Venetian authorities declared that because Ramondi had hand-carved the engraving plates, and because he made three subtle alterations to the original design, the prints were not exact copies, but merely excellent imitations. Ramondi should not be blamed for being as skilled an artist as Durer, and Durer should be flattered that his work was considered important enough to copy, or so went their rationale. Ramondi was required to remove Durer's signature from the plates, and the Dalyezus family was forced to sell Ramondi's versions as explicit copies, revoking the claim that they were Durer originals. Had this case been brought in court today in Italy or the United States, Columbia University law professor James Ginsburg has noted that the outcome would be quite different. Contemporary copyright law would see Ramondi's work as an infringement because it substantially copied the original image, and the inclusion of the AD monogram would be considered passing off copies as originals, thereby violating trademark law. But back in 1506, in the first known case of art-specific intellectual property law brought to trial, Durer would not receive complete satisfaction. Durer stormed off back to Nuremberg unhappy with the result. He had heard the argument before that he should be flattered that his work was so famous as to draw copyists. But the last time he had heard it, it related to some crazy old man selling doodles by Durer outside the Nuremberg Town Hall. When he came to publish his 1511 edition of Life of the Virgin, Durer was careful to include his vituperative copyright warning. Welcome to the history of art forgery. Because this is a large subject and I have only a short time, I thought it would be most useful to introduce four categories of art forgery, which might help to codify the field from a criminological point of view. First off, we must be certain to make the distinction between fakes and forgeries. Although for practical purposes the terms are often used interchangeably to define artworks that are passed off as a work of greater value than they actually are, there are distinct definitions from a criminological standpoint. Fake, an object that has been tampered with for the purpose of deception. Forgery is an object made wholesale in fraudulent imitation of something else. A fake, therefore, is an original object that has somehow been doctored, a painting to which a spurious signature was added, as in the example of William Sykes adding a counterfeit inscription to the back of an authentic 15th century Flemish painting to convince people that it was by Jan van Eyck. Tautologically speaking, that was a fake and not a forgery, although the actual inscription that Sykes added to the back of the painting was itself a forgery. In simplest terms, a forgery is an object made from scratch, while a fake is a pre-existing object that is altered in some way in order to commit fraud. Sykes's addition of a forged inscription, an inscription made from scratch, turned an authentic 15th century painting into a fake, an original object altered for the purposes of fraud. John Myatt's Impressionist paintings are technically forgeries, not fakes, since they are not original objects that have been tampered with, but are wholesale new objects made in fraudulent imitation of a past style in order to deceive victims into thinking that they are originals. We will not split hairs nor call to account Myatt's own description of his paintings as genuine fakes when technically speaking he should call them genuine forgeries, but it's useful to understand the distinction. It's also crucial to understand that a crime is only committed by a copyist if someone's rights are violated or someone is defrauded of income. For either fakes or forgeries to be tried in court, a crime must be committed involving them. This may seem obvious, but it's an important point to underscore. This is usually the crime of fraud, wherein falsely making or altering a writing or other work affects one's legal rights, economic status, or obligations of another person. 
If Han van Mechelen forged Vermeer paintings, but never tried to sell them or claim that they were made by Vermeer, then no crime would have been committed. Someone must be victimized, in short, whether that is a specific person, like a buyer who was duped, or a more abstract victim, like an artist's reputation. As Kenneth Polk and Duncan Chappelle, professor specializing in forgery, wrote, quote, One, there must be some form of deception by a defendant. And two, this deception must have produced some form of harm to three, a victim who was in fact deceived, and four, there was some level of knowledge, intent, or dishonesty on the part of the defendant. The precise charges which may flow from any fraud investigation will depend upon the particular evidentiary mix surrounding these four elements and the peculiarities of the fraud law in any given jurisdiction. Based on police files and historical studies, which I've been examining for more than a year now as my next book is an illustrated history of forgery that will be published by Fiden in about a year. We may distinguish four basic categories of forgery and deception into which any case studies may fit. And this is what I wanted to highlight in today's talk. One, wholesale forgery. The creation of a new, completely original work of art professed to have been made by someone else whose authorship will, will result in a greater sale value of the object. The majority of case studies that one might examine will be cases of wholesale forgeries, from the works of Han von Mechren and Eric Hebern to John Myatt and the products of Eli Sakai's workshop, and even William Henry Ireland's infamous Shakespeare papers. This method is the most complicated and requires the most industry and skill in order to produce something that will fool expert analysis. Wholesale forgery is something of a redundant phrase, since our criminological definition of forgery is a wholesale work, but we include it to make a clear distinction between forgeries and altered objects, which we call fakes. Category 2. Fake, or the alteration of an authentic work. The alteration of or addition to an authentic work of art to suggest a different authorship or subject matter that results in greater sale value of the object. This is obviously far simpler than forgery, but it requires acquiring something authentic in the first place. I mentioned William Sykes' three-part alteration that resulted in a famous fake. William Sykes, an 18th century libertine and forger, purchased an authentic 15th century Flemish painting of notable quality. But it was anonymous, neither the artist nor the subject matter was known. To this original work, Sykes added the following three elements by way of a forged inscription on the back of the panel to increase its value. He wrote that the painting had been A. Made by Jan van Eyck, B. Painted for King Henry V of England, and 3. Represented St. Thomas of Becket. Other examples of fakes may cross between these first two categories. A forger created a Dali painting, a wholesale forgery, but tricked Salvador Dali into signing it for Dali, not someone who would have been described as solidly grounded and in touch with reality, genuinely believed that the forged painting was his own work. Therefore, the forger had a forged painting, made from scratch, to which Dali was induced to add his authentic signature. Likewise, an original painting can be given a fraudulent signature, which is also a form of fake. The third category is the misattribution of an authentic work, and this is a tricky one. This is a confidence trick to convince a potential buyer that a work is of greater value than it actually is, or inversely, to convince a potential seller that a work is of lesser value, therefore swindling the seller out of higher pay. Misattribution is very difficult to prove, as those involved can always claim to have made a mistake in their attribution. It is only a criminal matter if a priori intent to deceive can be proven. You could discuss attributions by renowned art experts like Bernard Berenson and Anthony Blunt, whose opinion so powerfully affected the value of any work in question that it was considered a given that their attribution was correct. But whether Blunt intentionally or accidentally confirmed the authenticity of works that were actually Eric Hebern forgeries, well, that's still a matter of debate. But in the previous example, even the Kolnagi Gallery was guilty of a form of misattribution if we are to believe Eric Hebern's account of his start as an art forger. Hebern alleged that the gallery's experts tricked him by claiming that the drawings he offered to sell them were of considerably less value than they actually were. 
Hebron sold them to Kolnagi, at which point the gallery priced them appropriately at far higher value and put them in the window to sell. According to Hebern, he got the idea to begin his career as a forger when he noticed this, that he had been swindled by Kolnagi, and then he decided to create his own forged old master drawings to sell to Kolnagi and thereby get a sort of passive-aggressive revenge at the art community as a whole that had tricked him. Now, the trickiest and, I think, most interesting category is the fourth one that I'd like to talk about briefly today. And this is something that I have termed a provenance trap. Provenance traps are less a category of forged object than a series of ingenious methods to pass off forged objects. And there are three types of provenance traps, which are most often applied to wholesale forgeries as a confidence trick to ensure that the forgeries are not questioned. Each technique uses provenance, the documented history of an object, to the forger's advantage, as scholars rely on provenance to a great extent to determine authenticity. A new object must fit somewhere into the known documented history of an artist's oeuvre in order to be convincing. Therefore, a forger must prepare a work that will stand up to provenance research. The first two types of provenance traps involve the basic psychological principle that the person presenting a new object for authentication or sale should not come out and state what the object is, or rather what it purports to be. If a little old lady from Stoke-on-Trent showed up at an auction house claiming to be in possession of a Monet, then the first reaction would be incredulity. Stating just what one possesses is a bad idea and can immediately raise suspicions, resulting in either outright dismissal or an uncomfortably close examination of the object in question, one that a forger would not wish to endure. Instead, the front man in the forgery scheme lays no claim to the authenticity, nature, or value of the work that he proffers. Rather, he leaves one or more clues as to the origins that the buyer or authenticating expert can search out and discover himself. With a psychological trap in mind, there are three main subcategories of provenance traps that we can examine here. First one, a fake or forgery can be prepared to match existing real provenance for a lost artwork. This is a trick that was used by the Greenhalsh family. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into these case studies in detail, but perhaps at a future date we can discuss them. Many of them you'll already be familiar with. B. A forged or fake provenance may be inserted into real archives to be discovered by investigating scholars, a ploy used to devastating effect by John Drew, the mastermind behind John Myatt's forgeries. Or C. An authentic work with authentic provenance can be purchased, and then a copy secretly made of it. This copy may then be sold on with the accompanying original provenance, as in the case of Eli Sakai. In each instance, the buyer or authenticator brings himself to the exciting conclusion that the object proffered is the missing artwork mentioned in the provenance that he has discovered. This con takes advantage of the enthusiasm of discovery on the part of the buyer, who gleefully steps into this bear trap laid out by the con man, immersing himself in the thrill of the chase. It's a treasure hunt for grown-ups, a search through archives for evidence of lost treasures. In each of these three cases, the basic principle is that the work offered for sale is not claimed to be anything particularly interesting or exciting but some clue suggesting that it might be of interest is added along with the object itself. And I'll give you just a quick example. In the case of the Sean Greenhalsh family forgeries, Greenhalsh is historically the most diversely successful forger in history. For 17 years, he successfully forged all manner of objects from ancient Egyptian calcite sculpture to 7th century Assyrian sculptural reliefs to 20th century paintings, 19th century watercolors, even a telescope purportedly from the James Cook expedition to Australia. And each one of them he made in the garden shed in the back of his home. He lived in a council estate in Bolton, England, a very low income situation, and he shared a one bedroom apartment with his 80 year old parents and his brother. 
How did he pass these off? Well, in each instance, Sean created the work from scratch and they were not altogether convincing if you were to technically examine them. But he used a provenance trap to devastating effect. Essentially, if the provenance looks good enough, very few gallerists or auctioneers will look any closer at the object because at least at a subconscious level, there's a desire on the part of everyone involved in the art trade that every art object, they almost will it or hope that it will be authentic. Everyone loses out if an object is stolen or fake. The seller loses out and may be criminally liable. The buyer loses their trophy. The middleman loses their commission. Scholars who have written about it may lose face or lose out on an object to study. So at least at a subconscious level, the art world wants new and exciting objects to be authentic and legitimate. And that's the situation into which a clever criminal can step and take advantage. Sean Greenhalgh's father, who is an 80-year-old in a wheelchair, claimed to have been a war veteran, he would present objects as part of his family collection, and he would say that some relative, a great-grandfather, purchased them, and he would mention roughly where they were from. They were from Yorkshire, and they may have been purchased in the late 19th century, um, but he doesn't really know. He has no idea if he has anything of value or not, and could he be enlightened about it? And he brought objects to the British Museum, to Sotheby's, to a number of institutions who he essentially tricked. If he had come out and said, this is an Amarna, ancient Egyptian calcite sculpture, then he would have raised suspicions. But instead, he brought a sculpture and he set it down and said, is this worth anything? And his own backstory was one that inspired a great degree of sympathy. He claimed to have been a war veteran. He was in a wheelchair. People wanted to have good news for him. But he planted a clue that would lead a well-educated researcher to a trap that had already been laid out for him. And the clue is this. Sean Greenhalgh created works that matched descriptions from an authentic piece of provenance, an 18th century auction catalog from an estate sale in Yorkshire. That auction catalog had very few images in it. It had very brief descriptions. So it was relatively easy to create an object that would roughly match the description. For instance, a Roman lanx, a silver platter. Sean Greenhalgh purchased Roman silver coins, so they were of the appropriate age. He melted them down and he recreated this Roman lanx. And the story related to the provenance was that it had been found when uh, a farmer had smacked into it with his plow and it had broken. And so Sean broke it and mended it, soldering it together so it looked like it matched the story of the provenance. And then he wrote the lot number from this sale in Yorkshire on the back of it and then erased it so that only a fate remnant of the lot number was present. And in this way, he created an object to match existing authentic provenance. But he did not say, this is from this estate sale. That would have also raised suspicions. He allowed the researcher to take the clues given to find the estate sale, to find the catalog, to find the lot number. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, the same lot number is barely visible on this piece. And this was a repeatedly used technique, this provenance trap, by Greenhalgh, but also by people in other fields. And in each case, it works very well because it takes advantage of this inherent enthusiasm on the part of members of the art trade, whose job it is to look for provenance to match objects, because the more provenance, the more value the object has, and the easier it is to sell for a higher value. Or in the case of museums, you look for provenance to establish authenticity. So criminals understanding this use these provenance traps to devastating effect. That was example one. Very briefly, example two with John Drew and John Myatt. John Drew created fake provenance, inserted it into real archives, and then had John Myatt create wholesale forgeries of impressionist, post-impressionist style paintings that then matched the fake provenance that was now in real archives. This was doubly devastating because a work by, say, Giacometti that does not appear in the catalog raisonné would appear in an artist's, uh, would appear in an auctioneer's office or a gallerist's office. And he would say, okay, could this possibly be authentic? Where does he go? He goes to the archives 
And in the archives he finds a document that no one has ever seemed to notice before. Perhaps it was stuck to the back of another piece of paper, which is one trick that John Drew used. But all of a sudden he finds it and that treasure hunt instinct clicks into place and he thinks, I've found this archival material that no one has seen before and it matches the very work of art that's sitting on my desk right now. And that is a powerful tool to build momentum um, on the part of the researcher to think that they've discovered this great lost treasure because of course every art historian wants to be Indiana Jones and wants to find uh, a lost work of art or a lost treasure. So the problem with this second version of the provenance trap that John Drew employed is that it pollutes real archives and all of a sudden we don't know if the material in the archives is authentic or if some con man like John Drew inserted it there. So that's especially devastating. The third example is the most complicated, the most fanciful, but does really happen on occasion. Eli Sakai, a wealthy Manhattan art dealer, bought legitimate Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings by Renoir and Gauguin. They had accompanying authentic provenance. He then had Chinese copyists who were working upstairs at his gallery in Manhattan make exact copies of the legitimate works that he purchased. And he sold on the copies accompanied by the original provenance. And this was successful, but then he made a very silly mistake. He got the idea into his head that he could also then sell the original paintings. Since they were original, he would be able to get further documentation supporting their authenticity. And so essentially he tried to sell each one of these paintings twice, once as a copy accompanied by original provenance and once the original alone. And of course, it makes sense to us now that that's not possible to do, especially in the internet age, and that's how he got caught. So these are the examples of the provenance trap that I wanted to briefly outline for you today. We must keep in mind that the aforementioned categories represent criminal activity, the intent to deceive normally resulting in the crime of fraud. And of course, there are many non-criminal reasons why a work of art might be misattributed, sometimes to the benefit of the owner, but not necessarily in the sense of proactive fraud. We should also consider artist workshops, for example, from Rembrandt to Jeff Koons. In many cases, it is difficult to tell which works were actually made in the master's presence and which simply supervised by the master. There are overambitious attributions without criminal intent as well. The details of chemical and technical analysis have, of course, leave into your good hands as you understand it far better than I. But I hope that this very brief introduction to a very large topic will give you an interesting point of departure for further discussion. Thank you very much for having me.